Okay, um, the second sort of basic thing behind natural selection is that life is tough. The environment presents challenges to survival and to reproduction. When we get into ecology, we'll start to talk about tolerance curves and how when you are where everything in your life is great, you're getting enough calories, you're the right temperature, um, you can be successful, you can grow, you can thrive, and you can reproduce. If you're not getting enough calories, guess what? You can't reproduce. The body shuts down reproduction. Um, this happens with a lot of female athletes, um, not like at the Olympic or professional level. There are women who stop menstruating because the body basically says, look, you are on the edge of survival yourself here, sista. You do not have the resources to, because for a woman, reproduction is a lot more energy. It's a huge amount of energy to grow a fetus. It's a big deal. Um, and the body effectively says, hey, you don't have the energy to spare. This will kill you and shuts off reproductive capacity. So any organism that isn't basically getting its physical needs met starts off by losing the ability to reproduce. And this happens, um, pl you see this in plants. Plants will only flower, which is reproduction, flowers are all about sex, when their environmental conditions are favorable. So a lot of the plants that I have in here are tropical plants. Or they're, you know, domesticated ancestors of tropical plants. Actually, here, here's one. Who likes avocados? This is an avocado. These are avocado trees. When I eat avocados, I stick the pits in a pot with some soil in it, and they often sprout. Now, I love avocados. I would love to be able to grow my own steady supply of avocados, and I would eat cheap guacamole all winter long, and I'd be a very happy camper. These are never going to flower. They're never going to reproduce. It's not going to happen. They're, they're surviving. <laughs> they're growing a little bit. But these live in a tropical environment with tons of rain and hot, hot, hot summers and warm, warm winters. And I've got them stuck in pots in Ohio. And in the summer, I put them out on my deck and I water them copiously and they get lots of sun and they get as much heat as an Ohio slash Pennsylvania summer can give you. But it's not the kind of like steam bath sauna that these plants evolved in. They're, they're not at a point where they're going to reproduce. They're just, they're not there. I mean, they're not going to get as big as they would in the wild because I'm really challenging them to just hang on and survive. So the environment that you find yourself in presents challenges to survival and reproduction. For species in the wild, it might be not getting enough calories. Um, in terms of survival, it might be not getting enough calories. You could starve to death. It might be that everything on the planet wants to eat you. Think of our little rabbit. Rabbits are nervous for a reason. They are a fantastic prey species. Everything thinks rabbits are delicious. So the environment presents some challenges to survival and reproduction. The third tenet of natural selection. Individuals tend to have more babies than will survive. You can think about this. Well, we're going to sum all of these up in, in three-word phrases. I always think about this as many will die. And it sounds like a tagline from some horror movie. Has anybody here ever raised mice at home? I keep threatening to get a mouse tank for the classroom. I keep not doing it. Doesn't count. I've had that too. But um, if you just leave mice to their own devices, they will breed like mice. They reproduce. I think they have a three-week gestation, and they can they're fertile at like a week or two, and it's exponential growth at its finest. You can end up with hundreds of mice in six months. They will have lots and lots and lots and lots of babies. Babies everywhere! And in the wild, mice can do that too. But they don't all make it. Out of a, a you know, nest of baby mice with ten individuals, maybe two or three of them live to adulthood. Maybe one or two of them live to adulthood and get to reproduce. I mean, it's just not that easy to make it in the wild. We're really insulated from this as humans, as modern humans. Um, 
because we have abundant resources, we have abundant ways to keep warm, we are not literally battling the elements, and it's freezing cold out there. How different would your life be if keeping warm was reliant on just you being out there? It's a pretty ugly picture. We would all die very quickly, actually. We're not equipped to live out there in these conditions. So um, life is tough, and many will die. Okay, the fourth tenet of natural selection. Individuals with mutations or features that have some advantage for survival tend to pass on more of their genes. They tend to have just a little bit of an advantage and they tend to pass on more of their genes. Lucky them. Okay, so that's the four basic premises behind natural selection. If you had to sum each of those up in three words, and what I'd like you to do now actually is join with those at your island nation. If you are all alone on an island nation, you can go join another island nation. Um, and I want you to come up with three word summations of these four points. Okay? Go. So, the goal here is to, to do a three word summation that expresses the idea behind the, the thought. So the, the full version of this is all, very, all populations have natural variation. Variation exists in a population. Do any of these not really express that idea? Do we want to vote any off of the island? Okay, so we've, we've had a, a self-voting off the island of strong will survive. So what we're left with is mutation variation, populations have variation, natural variation population. But this really isn't necessarily in words that you would use every, every day. So is there a way that you could sum this up in three words that expresses the idea that all populations have natural variation? but puts it in words that you might use every day. This is the one that I kind of have in my head. Everyone's different. Now, does it give us all the technical detail we really need to understand natural selection? No. But is it a reminder in everyday language of what we're talking about here? That within every population, if we look at all the members of that population, <laughs> there are going to be differences between them. Everybody is different. Would that work? Yeah. It's not it's it's not the it's it's not the right answer. There isn't a right answer for this. This is mostly a way for you to remember and think about the the premise in words that are more approachable. So, everybody's a little different, which is four words, I realize, but in my head that's kind of how I say it. Everyone is different. Everyone's a little different. Whether it's ear length in rabbits, whether it's finger length in humans, whether it's leg length in deer, whether it's, oh, goodness, um, number of bristles on a grasshopper leg, whatever it is, don't copy this down. Don't copy this down. Um, whatever it is, for any characteristic we can measure, for any population, we're going to find differences. So everybody's different. Okay. All right, three-word synopsis for... The environment presents challenges to survival and reproduction. What's your three-word summary? All right. So we've got um, four different three-word or less synopses for the environment presents challenges to survival and reproduction. Are there any of them that you don't feel like express the idea or express it clearly enough or make... They're all, these are all pretty good. There, there might... I'm, I'm biased because one of them comes rather close to, to the one that I usually use. Um, I always say, life is tough. And it's true. Life is tough. Um, 
and it's it's tough for all species at all times all the time um, I will say that modern humans in Western nations have it really relatively easy um, realize how easy we have it um, the the person in the US who has it the hardest probably has it easier than people in some other nations in some other parts of the world so life is tough life is challenging um, you gotta fight to survive challenging life challenged for survival I'm having you guys do this because I want you to be able to think about these in real terms okay so let's go to number three Number three is, individuals tend to produce more offspring than will survive. How would you summarize that in three words? What do you have? Few offspring survive. <coughs> what else? What do you guys have? Cameron and Dylan. Reproduce to survive. What, else, what do you guys have? More than I love it. I love it. That's great. It's awful, but it's fantastic. Um, rather fatalistic and depressing, and why even get out of bed in the morning? But, you know, okay. <laughs> it's great. Well, okay, so let's think about rabbits. We've talked about rabbits. We've talked about my little short-eared, stumpy-eared friend in the neighborhood. Um, anybody here have barn cats or outside cats? Okay. I had, her name was Mushy. I got her for my 12th birthday. I was 30 years old when she died. She lived for 18 years as an outside cat. Do you know how unusual that is? By the time she died, she had half of one ear, two teeth, and three legs. Yeah, and she was, I was going to call her something else. She was just awful. She was terrible. I loved her. She was nice to me. She hated everybody else. And she was a vicious, voracious, efficient killer. She was a killing machine. In her prime, she sometimes brought in seven dead bodies a day. She cleared, we figured, a two-mile radius around our house of all small furry things. She was, she was death on four paws, then death on, death on three paws. Um, losing the leg did slow her down a little bit. Um, she dropped down to like two or three things. I'm not kidding. She hunted with three legs. She was a machine. Death to all. And I remember one summer afternoon, probably in high school. It's home for the day. <laughs> Mushy brought in a half-consumed baby bunny. Good cat. Good cat. And then about an hour later, she brought in another one. And over the course of the day, she killed an entire nest of baby bunnies. And you know what she finished it off with? Their mother. I'm not kidding. She killed eight rabbits in one day. She ate them, most of them, the, what she didn't leave on the back doorstep. Oh. She, was, she was a predator from, you know I'm really struggling with language here, right? She was one heck of a predator. She was a great cat. She was so sweet to me. She would sit on my lap and purr, and make little needy paws. She was very sweet to me. Wouldn't have been if I was a bunny. So, in one day, that rabbit's entire genetic contribution eliminated. Sorry, bunny, you lose. And then to top it off, we're going to make sure that you don't make a further genetic contribution. <laughs> Kill them all. Born to die. That whole nest of baby bunnies. Dead. One day. So, I always think of this as 
many will die, which sounds, it's, it's about as bad as Born to Die. Um, but I think of like, you know, some horror movie trailer that I have in my head with my cat's face in the credits looming up, shown from the perspective of a rabbit or a mouse or a shrew or a vole or a mole or a bird or a chipmunk or a squirrel or a bat because she killed them all. Um, so, lots are born. Many will die. Born to die, yes. Lots of things don't make it through life. If you are living out in the wild, your odds of survival in some cases are pretty slim. They're stacked against you. The ones that actually make it to adulthood are very few and very far between. For rabbits, if we looked at like every rabbit in Columbia County, because we're talking about rabbits because of my killer cat, um, out of 100 rabbits, how many do you figure actually survive the first six months of life? It might only be 10. It might literally be that low. Between a combination of predators, starvation, anything else that can happen, disease, rabbits are susceptible to some, they're susceptible to some viruses and bacterial infections that are similar to what affect humans. Um, it's all stuff that kills you. Born to die. Many will die. Those are my favorites. They sound the grimmest. And it is grim. Lots of offspring come into the world and not a lot make it to adulthood. Not a lot make it to reproduction. Now, I want to look at a couple here. These. Especially reproduce to survive. If you reproduce, does that guarantee you'll survive? No. Just ask that bunny. She reproduced. She didn't survive, nor did any of her offspring. Her entire genetic contribution gone. So it's not, it's not enough to survive. You got to survive, you got to reproduce, and you got to make sure your offspring survive. So that's, that's where the fierce parental thing comes from. I mean, it's chemical. It's hardwired. It is, you know millions and billions of years of evolution, you make sure your offspring survive. Not that you don't love your offspring for lots of altruistic reasons, but man, guess which offspring survived? The ones whose parents would fight for them at any cost. I'm sure that Mama Bunny did as much damage to the cat as she could. Or she ran. There are species who, who do an adaptive thing where you have a bunch of babies and you kind of leave them to fend for themselves. You hope a few of them make it. Fish. Has anybody here seen fish spawning? Ooh, in the spring, go to Guilford or Highland Town or whatever your favorite fishing hole is. And in the shallows, you will see these god-awful storms of chaos and mud and flipping tails and stuff. And you know what it is? It's carp making nests and then rolling around in them and mixing up their eggs and sperm. Do you know how they care for those babies? They don't. <laughs> they don't. She, he makes a really nice place for eggs. She comes along and squirts her eggs in it. He may even push her towards his nest to squirt her eggs into. He goes over, squirts his sperm on top, and then they both swim away. All done. There is no pregnancy, there is no parental care, there is no nursing, they're not mammals, only mammals nurse. And they're done. Now, how many of their babies survive to adulthood? They have no idea. <laughs> how many babies are there in that nest? Hundreds. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. And maybe five or six or ten, maybe a hundred, maybe it's a good year for that particular little carp. You can't even call them a couple. It's like Finding Nemo. It is a little bit like Finding Nemo, yeah. Like, many will die. Many will die. And different species have different strategies that have evolved to ensure that some of their offspring, some of their genetic contribution makes it to adulthood. And yeah, actually, that mother rabbit, and it, could, it might not have even been the mother of that bunch. It could have just been another random adult bunny 
that my evil predator cat killed, um, I didn't exactly like inspect it. It could have been a boy for all I know. I didn't, you know, didn't look, just buried what was left. Um, it's quite probable actually that the mother of those kits ran um, or was nowhere near the nest. So, lots are born, lots die. That's six words, but it's true. Now, for humans, a quick word about this. Um, this is not so much the case for humans in the Western world these days. How many of you are one of 12 or more children? That's the usual answer. I, I have yet to have a student who's more, who is one of 12 or more children. It's not real common these days. These days I know people who are one of like five and people are like, wow, that's such a big family. And at one time that would have been a relatively small family. How many of you have a grandparent who is one of 10 or more? I have multiple grandparents who are one of 10 or more. Um, how many of you know, and you may not know this, if you have great grandparents who are one of 10 or more? Probably most of you do. Great and great grandparents. Um, at one time in the US, in Europe, it was common for people to have 10 or 12 or actually I think my great grandfather was one of 17 born. Um, my, one of my best friends, they joke, she's Greek, and they joke about her Yaya never learned to drive because Yaya couldn't fit behind the steering wheel because she was pregnant for 25 years straight. Um, her father was one of 18. He was the youngest of 18. All his siblings have these great, rich Greek names, and he's named Harry. And I was like, why is your dad just Harry? And she's like, because Yaya forgot what she named him. I'm not sure if it's a joke. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, eventually just kind of forgot what his name was. She's like, yeah, Harry, whatever, come on. That was pretty common. So my great-grandfather was one of 17 children born to a woman. I think 11 of them survived to adulthood. I think 10 of them survived into adulthood long enough to reproduce on their own. Because there was one who died at like 16 or 17 never reproduced. Um, what did they die of? Pick it. Childhood disease was a big one. Um, there was a pair of twins in that family, both of whom died. One died at like two months of age, one died at a year. Um, childhood diseases used to regularly kill children. There were some cultures in which, and there probably still are, the, you didn't really celebrate a child until their first birthday because you didn't really get all that attached to them until their first birthday because lots of babies died in their first year which is horrifying. We don't live there now. Um, huh? It's like a TV show. Yeah, it is. It is. That wasn't all that uncommon. But in those big families now, most of the children make it to adulthood. Because we have modern medicine, we have all these other factors that allow... We have immunization. My gosh, my daughter got like 10 different vaccines in her first two years of life. And of that... Many of those were killers in the past. Hey, folks, have a good weekend.